Yo guys, we're back for um, another week of predictions, and this week it's uh, UFC Fight Night 126, uh, Cerrone versus Yancy Medeiros, and uh, we're gonna get right into it. First fight of the night's gonna be uh, Oscar William, Oscar Pichota versus Tim Williams, and uh, you know Tim Williams has been a guy that's uh, been pretty close to making it to the UFC for a while now. Um, been on tough, he uh, beat Bojan Vlachkovic on tough, and uh, now he's won on. A uh, pretty good run of, of recently. You know, he beat Jay Silva, beat Nishan Burrell, two guys that are pretty well known. Um, he's a grinder. You know, his striking is kind of a means to an end. He uses his striking across the distance, gets you against the cage, and, uh, you know, he'll keep cage control, work uh, trips, doubles, single legs. He really likes to try to work for a lot of takedowns, but his best takedown is definitely a, a trip takedown. And uh, he doesn't seem like he has the greatest wrestling, but it. It's definitely what he likes to go to the most in his fights. And uh, on top, he looks for chokes and submissions, but uh, not much ground and pound. And uh, he could definitely be a blanket at times. Um, definitely wears on you as the rounds go on. And pretty dominant grappling by the later rounds. If he can get you down early, then he'll be dominant with his grappling in the later rounds. He really has great cardio, and I think he'll be ready for the moment. You know, he, he uh, fought on tough three times, so I think he'll be ready to... Uh, jump up and uh, try to prove himself in the UFC level. But uh, Oscar Pachota is a really tough matchup for the first fight. He's one of the best prospects at 185. Um, you know, he's a Robert Drysdale black belt, multi-time, uh, you know, world and Euro uh, medalist. Uh, he's competed in ADCC as well, uh, former Cage Warriors champion. And he just doesn't give a curve, well, man, and he's a finisher. Um, really good striking. He has KO power. Uh, four finishes in under a minute, and uh, five submissions, you know, uh, Japanese necktie, and he's really started to uh, sure up his striking, you know, how he came in with the jiu-jitsu already, but um, now he's just become much cleaner with the striking, uh, great job of gauging distance, he, he can really stay at kicking range, and uh, very powerful left hook, and his high kicks are very dangerous, uh, really comes at you from tricky angles, and he does a good job of uh, you know, slipping the high kicks in there, and he can do a lot of damage with them, uh, really knock you out with them, and uh, he took the back of uh, Jonathan Wilson, had great control, and uh, I just think this is a great matchup just to the fact that um, he's much better than Tim Williams on the ground, and uh, on the feet, he's already better, and Tim Williams' best thing to do is take the fight to the ground, so it's kind of nullified in this matchup, and I don't think that Tim Williams' striking is on the level to be able to uh, say, like, fuck it and stand with Pichota. So he's really, um, I struggle to find ways that he's going to win this fight. But, um, you know, I think uh, Williams is going to try to crowd him, try to do what he does. And I think uh, Pichota is going to be uh, timing him to entries. He's going to be trying to, um, you know, catch him coming in. I think he's going to catch him clean with a, with the right hand and uh, drop him, knock him out. Or I think he's going to catch him with the left hook and drop him and submit him, and, or uh, TKO him, one or the other, and, uh, you know, Tim Williams has been TKO'd three times, and uh, Diego Lima submitted him, uh, Anthony Smith submitted him, so I definitely think that Pichot is the better fighter here, and I'm going to go with him by um, KO in round one, and that's one of my most confident picks of the night there, and then uh, up next you have a fight with uh, Brandon Davis, who's coming back, uh, relatively quickly after that loss to um, Kyle Bokniak, and he's coming to fight another guy that fought in the um, contender series, Steven Peterson, and um, this is a pretty good fight, you know, um, originally it was supposed to be Humberto Bandene in this spot, and I'm a little disappointed we didn't get to see that matchup, you know, um, Humberto's a very good prospect, and uh, I really like Steven Peterson, I've watched him uh, fight live quite a few times at uh, LFA, and, um, you know, he's a grinder as well, but has a uh, KO power, and he definitely is uh, just extremely, extremely aggressive, man. He comes forward, um, you know, doesn't have the cleanest technique, the cleanest striking, but he just makes it a dogfight, man, and uh, he can really, you know, drag people into that deep water, and, um, you know, I think that uh, he just really likes, likes to fight, man. He's good with his, uh, you know, pushing people against the cage, working with shots, uh, great cardio, um, he kind of likes to uh, uh, try to take you down with doubles and single legs against the cage, and he's busy on top looking for submissions and uh, 
heavy ground and pound uh, definitely likes to take the back and also has a really slick guillotine as well so his submission game's on point and uh off his back he'll attack with subs you know on plot his kimura's guillotines very active off of his back and um you know, he's pretty good on the feet. He's not, like, a terrible on the feet. He's just sloppy. You know, he's someone that'll take mm -hmm. shots to give shots. Someone that likes to come in, um, you know, really make you feel him coming in. Uh, and uh, he has some power. You know, he got a TKO against Dustin Winter in his last fight. And he's someone that'll never give up, man. That guy's never going to back off. He's never going to give an inch, man. He really kind of reminds me of a Jason Knight type guy, you know. Except I think he maybe has a bit better... Um, overall game than Jason Knight but then uh Brandon Davis is a guy who came in he had a great performance on uh the contender series where he was um you know able to uh really keep Arnett up who is another striker but then uh really showed his deficiencies against Kyle Bokniak he struggled with you know um being able to keep the distance and strike he struggled with getting taken down against Bokniak and I think that Steven Peterson's even better than Bokniak at that same game plan, which is pressure, pace, and just getting in um, Brandon Davis's face, making him feel him. Um, this is uh, Steven Peterson uh, coming up. You know, he, he is usually a 135-pounder, so um, it'll be interesting to see uh, how he adapts to that. Brandon Davis might be a little bit too big for him, but, you know, I think uh, Steven Peterson has a pretty good frame for the division as well, and um. I just think that he's going to be able to get inside on Brandon Davis. I think Brandon Davis, if he can keep it on the outside, has a very good chance to win this fight. But I think that he's going to get grinded out by uh, Steven Peterson, man. Steven Peterson also has a hell of a chin, so it's going to take a lot for uh, Brandon Davis to take him out. And, uh, you know, I just think Steven Peterson's going to put that grind on him, man, in his hometown. Not hometown, home state, and um, get that win and, uh, you know, take out Brandon Davis and get Brandon Davis two losses in a row in the UFC, but uh, up next we have Joshua Berkman against Alex Morono, and um, you know they're bringing back Joshua Berkman again, um, not really sure how many more fights they're going to give him, you know, he's lost, uh, I think six of his last seven fights, and then uh, also has that no contest where he lost to Hector Lombard as well, so he's really on it. Very, very, very um, bad run here. And his one win was against uh, KJ Nunes, who retired uh, promptly after that fight. So, really doesn't have, um, you know, very good momentum coming in this fight. And he was knocked out really viciously in his last fight against Drew Dober. He's been talking about retirement on and off, you know. And uh, I'm just not really sure if he's into it. He's gotten really rocked twice early in his last two fights against Michelle Prezeres. Really got robbed, taken down, submitted early against Drew Dober. Got knocked out really before the fight even got a chance to get going, you know. And uh, really don't like the directions he's going. But, you know, Josh Berkman in the past was a guy that was very well-rounded. Had good striking, good kicks, uh, very fluid. And, uh, you know, good grappling as well. Good takedown defense, good takedowns. Could get submissions on you. Um, could get TKOs as well. But, you know, he just hasn't been that guy, you know, since he's... Uh, returned to the UFC um, from WSOF, and he's 37 years old now, and um, Alex Morono has actually been, um, you know, pretty impressive in his fights. You know, he had a fight against Nico Price, who's a pretty good guy at 170, and he really dominated the first round with his striking. He kind of has a uh, karate background and um, really was using good feints, good uh, movement, and uh, just really catching Nico Price, dropped him a couple times. He, uh, beat uh, Kyle Noak as well, beat James Muntasri, and uh, in his last fight he had a very close contest against Kiri Nakamura, in which I thought he won, but the fight was in uh, Japan, you know, so obviously um, Nakamura is going to be favored there in any close contest, but you know, um, Morono definitely um, is pretty good, man, he pumps his jab out there, has very good kicks, a very nice overhand right, and uh, he can uh, work well moving forward and going backwards. Uh, really likes to bomb that right hand. You know, really likes to attack with the right hand. And, uh, you know, I just think that he's going to catch Josh Berkman and knock him out early again, man. I just really don't know why um, Josh Berkman continues to fight here. He has nothing to prove. But um, so I'm going to go with Alex Morono to get the win here, keep the train rolling for um, the Texas natives. And, um, 
you know, hopefully, um, Joshua Berkman decides to hang him up after this, but, uh, up next we have a fight, uh, Sarah Morales against, uh, Lucy Pudaleva, and, you know, um, this isn't the greatest fight, but it should be, uh, pretty entertaining because both these girls come to fight, you know, Sarah Morris, very aggressive, uh, she returned after two years off and, uh, had a pretty good win against Ashley Evans-Smith, uh, first round armbar, uh, she actually almost broke Ashley Evans Smith's arm, you know, and she's very comfortable and at home in the cage, uh, and she starts right away, there's no, uh, you know, feeling out process, uh, she's never, you know, scared to engage, never tight, um, immediately likes to get in the clinch, uh, throw one-twos, has pretty good level changes, and, uh, but sometimes she get overpowered in her entries, and she'll get taken down herself, but off her back, she's very good, you know, she's, uh, very dexterous with their legs, and um, she's able to uh, put people in dangerous positions with arm bars and uh, inner guard. Uh, she has no problem with uh, attacking with strikes off her back as well with attack with elbows. Um, she actually beat uh, Alexis Dufresne um, off of her back, basically, in her fight. And uh, She's tough, man. She definitely won't quit. Uh, she took a beating against Jessica Andrade, um, was bloodied up. And then at the end of the fight, man, she almost locked in a rear naked choke in the final seconds. And, um, you know, um, so she's definitely a beast, man. She's never going to give up. And uh, solid cardio. She'll push through being tired. Uh, her striking definitely needs work, but she isn't afraid to uh, get hit and throw down. Um, she is a bit wide with her shots. Isn't the fast with her hand speed as well. And, you know, she definitely needs help in that um, uh, category. But uh, Lucy Pudilova is a striker. Um. She also loves to fight, you know, comes in uh, very willing to engage. Uh, but she likes to use movement, stay long with straight punches. Uh, very nice jab, and she does a great job of uh, slipping punches, returning with counters. But she doesn't seem to have the biggest power. She has good volume, and she could definitely cut you up. She has pretty good elbows as well. Um, she struggles getting clinched and held against the cage. Um, she's too easy to get a hold of, you know, and put in the clinch. I think she needs to work on her footwork a bit. And uh, we have to see much of her jiu-jitsu game, and she's never, she hasn't fought nearly as good a competition as Maras has. You know, she's um, been fighting uh, lower-level women, and uh, I think Maras just needs to use her physicality in this fight, close the distance, look for takedowns, clinch control, and I think she'll just be able to uh, just dominate Lucy Pudilova, make her just be in positions that she doesn't want to be in, take her down. Pudilova might get back up. Pudilova will have her moments in this fight, but. I think Sarah Morris overall will uh, be able to uh, get the decision with uh, her grappling. And then up next, we have a really fun fight, a fight that I like a lot. You know, Joby Sanchez against Roberto Sanchez. And uh, Joby Sanchez actually is uh, coming back to the UFC after uh, two consecutive wins on the Dana White Contender Series. Uh, he's a well-rounded fighter, good striking. He boxes well, digs to the body with hooks, fast hands, solid boxing. But he can get hit in the pocket, and he has a questionable chin. So uh, he definitely doesn't want to get hit here. Because he's definitely gotten hit, and I've seen him go down multiple times. He has good takedowns against the fence and in space. Does a great job of scrambling, getting out of submissions. He can be winning the fight the whole time and get rocked and finished, like I said. You know, definitely needs to worry about that chin. And uh, great cardio, and he's become more aware of his chin. Uh, so he likes to get in the clinch quicker, uh, start to grind more than trying to box. And uh, he'll be hungry to get a win. You know, obviously he wants to be in the UFC. He uh, fought twice on the Dana White Contender Series. Um, Roberto Sanchez is a great grappler, you know, good submission artist. But he's still very green on the feet. He bites down his mouthpiece, walks forward, uh, throws hard straight punches. But he stands tall. He can get hit. He can get clipped and dropped. Uh, he, that happened to him against um, Joseph Morales. He got clipped and dropped and sub submitted. Uh, he has a nice single leg, um, but I just don't think he's better than Joby Sanchez in any area other than, um, you know, jiu-jitsu. And I think Joby is good enough to be able to uh, get out of those positions. And I think Joby's going to be able to grind him out here. I think Joby will be uh, able to outbox him on the feet, take him down, uh, just kind of be a up-down shoot box type of style. <laughs> And uh, I think that uh, Roberto Sanchez is a bit too willing to go to his back here at the UFC level. That's not the best idea. So I just think Joby Sanchez is going to come in. He's going to have a lot of momentum here. Um, you know, a lot of want. I think he really wants to be in the UFC, wants to stay in the UFC. And um, 
I'm going to give it to Joby Sanchez here to come back and get a win in his second stint here in the OC. And uh, up next, we have two other, another guy that's off the uh, Dana White Contender Series, Jeff Neal. And he's fighting Brian Camozzi. And uh, Neal is solid, well-rounded fighter. Um, fast, straight punch combinations, good power. He likes to uh, move forward, put pressure on you, uh, throw strikes and grind you against the cage. Solid control against the cage, those knees and elbows from the clinch. He can hit uh, explosive double leg slams and uh, has a solid single leg as well. On top, he has heavy ground and pound, and I think he'll have a major speed advantage versus Kamozi. His reach is almost as long as Kamozi as well, which, you know, it's Kamozi's biggest advantage in most of his fights. He has a solid chin, and uh, I watched him. He took a lot of shots in a good fight against Kevin Holland, who's a uh, pretty solid 185 outside of the UFC. And I thought it was actually a bad stoppage, the TKO. And um, he won twice in 14 days in his last uh, two fights, so definitely he's been pretty active. Um, you know, Kamozi, uh, younger brother of uh, Chris Kamozi, you know, and he's long, uh, does a good job of using kicks. Uh, nice straight front kick to the body, throws a lot of leg kicks. But he's definitely a little bit slow with his hands, struggles to find his range and connect, and uh, struggles to, to defend straight punches. And uh, he has a decent check left hook. Does a good job of pressuring, cutting off the cage. And his hands have some pop on him for sure. You know, he does have, um, you know, some power that will definitely get your attention. I don't know about KO power. And uh, on the ground, he has a pretty good ground game. He'll attack with subs, you know, the arm bar. But he can be taken down. Seems like he has great cardio. He works at elevation. But Neil has good cardio as well. And uh, Kamozi's got TKO in his last two fights in the UFC and uh I kind of see that trend continuing here, man. I think that Jeff Neal is going to have the speed advantage in this matchup. I think he's going to connect with a hard straight punch combination and a finish with ground and pound. I think it's going to be early, man. I think Jeff Neal is going to really, uh, you know, make an impact and uh, really pronounce himself a, uh, you know, stamp himself big in this division in his first fight at 170 and get a first round uh, TKO of Chris Com or of Brian Camozzi and. Um, Yep, I'm going to go with Jeff Neal there. And uh, up next, we have a really amazing fight. I really love this fight. It's uh, Carlos Diego Ferreira against Jared Gordon. And, uh, you know, Carlos Diego Ferreira is getting a tough opponent off of you. Saw the suspension, man. You know, he's only fought two times in the last three years, so he's been very inactive. But, you know, you can't sleep on him, man. Very dangerous fighter. Third-degree black belt in jiu-jitsu amazing off of his back man and on top you know his jiu-jitsu game is just extremely dangerous very good legs you know goes full guard and uh gets sweeps he likes to uh take the back attack with rear naked chokes attacks with leg locks he also has uh solid striking you know it's a bit wild but it's dangerous you know throws solid hooks not afraid to throw down and uh he'll have burst of flurries but uh, overall he's a bit inactive on the feet has solid kicks as well, throw to the body, to the head. Um, his cardio is good, and, you know, he has some wins over a good competition. His last win was against uh, OAB, um, Olivier Bon Mercier. Um, he was a great fight with Benio Darius, where uh, it was pretty back and forth. He just got out-hustled on the feet. And uh, Gordon is a wrestler, you know, grinding wrestler, incredible pressure. He'll walk through punches. He throws straight and short hooks, uh, likes to close the distance, get inside. He likes to land his hands, uh, clinch and wrestle, you know, that's his game. And uh, he'll probably want to keep this fight standing. I don't think he wants to deal with that jujitsu at all. And I think he'll look to push the pace and break Ferrer. You know, Ferrer's coming off two years off. And uh, Gordon's definitely a bad matchup for someone coming off a long way off. He'll definitely test your cardio and um, make you fight, man. And I think he has a great chin. And uh, Diego just has one TKO against a very chinny um, Ramsey Nijum. So I think he's going to struggle to keep Gordon off him with the shots. And I think Gordon's going to walk through a lot of Diego's punches. And I think he's going to break Diego's forward pressure. I think he'll control the fight on the feet. I think he'll control, you know, um, the direction of the fight. I think he's going to control um, the setups as well. You know, I think he's definitely going to be someone that will just control the pace, too. And I think that uh, he's going to get a late finish here against Carlos Ferreira, but I could also see him getting a decision. And this is a close fight, man. If he does uh, play it stupid, doesn't have a good game plan, and uh, decides to test his grappling with Carlos Diego Ferreira, he could definitely get caught here. 
And, uh, you know, he can also get caught coming in, man. He's someone that, you know, walks through punches, walks forward, and uh, that definitely always gives him that, you know, opportunity to get KO'd. But I just don't see it here. I see him breaking Carlos Diego Ferreira, you know, off that long layoff. And I'm going to go with um, Jared Gordon to get the victory in that one. And uh, up next, we have uh, uh, Super Sage Northcutt against uh, Tibau Gauti. And, um, you know, this is a very interesting fight. Very good fight for the progression of Sage's career. And, you know, we uh, saw Sage coming in the UFC as a teenager. You know, so we had to watch his struggles, his growth live in color. You know, now he's working with Team Alpha Male, full-time in MMA, not in school anymore. And, you know, the guy's an incredible athlete. You know, that's just something that you can't sleep on because we don't have that many of those type of athletes in MMA. Blistering speed, uh, great dexterity in combinations with his kicks, and uh, his front leg is very good, you know. He's kind of like Stephen Wonderboy Thompson in that essence with the front leg. And uh, hits you with body kicks, hits you with head kicks. In his latest fight, he had extreme competence. Uh, walking down uh, Michel Quinones, he was bringing heavy pressure, really fast jab. And I think people are amazed at uh, Sage Northcutt's speed when they get in there with him, at least for a little bit, because a lot of people start slow against him. And he's still very much developing as a fighter. You know, we've yet to see him get hit hard and handle that well. He seems to panic a lot. And, uh, you know, against Mickey Gall, he seemed like he panicked, got submitted in that one. But he does have explosive takedowns as well. Um, you know, he can get double legs on top and has pretty good ground and pound. And I think on top, he's actually pretty good. It's on bottom that you have to worry about with him. You know, he got tapped out by Barbarina in a choke that wasn't even completely locked in. He struggled against Cody Fister off of his back. and um, But the UFC has given him a good guy to grow a bit here, I think. You know, Tabo Gatti is also a striker. He can grapple a little bit as well. You know, he has some very fundamental striking, good power in his hooks. and uh, But he comes forward with his chin up, and he's way too aggressive with bad defense. And, uh, been finished multiple times in his UFC career and very fast as well. But he has had a few good showings, you know. He had a pretty good um, showing in the loss to, uh, you know, um, Mercier, OAB, o Olivier Bon Mercier, and um, was competitive against David Tamor as well. But uh, he gets caught and struggles with explosive counters. And I think he's going to struggle to find Sage, you know, but Sage definitely needs to mix it up. I think he needs to take down uh, Tibalt Gauti, get on top wear him out a little bit early, and uh, Sage is at home, you know, he's going to be positive, good spirits, like he always is, he's working full-time with Team Alpha Male, but Valcanti definitely has a suspect chin, just like Sage does, and I don't think he'll be able to grapple with Sage, you know, I think Sage is just going to be the bigger, stronger athlete, I just think Sage needs to avoid getting clipped, you know, I think he needs to be on the outside, and I think he's just going to have enough to take out T-Ball Galti, man, I think he's going to be able to, um, you know, stay on the outside, throw kicks, throw uh, jabs, quick jabs, and uh, just not get hit, and actually uh, take Galti down as well, and I think he's going to be able to get the decision here, but there's still a lot of questions with Sage, you know, if he gets clipped, if he gets hit, will he just give up, will he panic, um, if he gets taken down, will he panic, so definitely not an automatic one, this is one of my least confident picks, but I'm going to go with Sage Northcutt to get the win in that one. And uh, up next, we have a great fight. You know, Tiago Alves against Curtis Millender. Wow. Man, this is a great card. And, you know, um, Tiago Alves is a guy who um been in the UFC for a long time. And I think he's just uh, now um, the UFC starting to get him in these spots to test guys because they've definitely put him here against Curtis Millender, um, who's coming in with a lot of attention, a lot of hype, two back-to-back -back head kick knockouts for his UFC debut. And, you know, Millinder's an exciting striker. He's long. Really tries to use his reach to his advantage as well. And tricky setups to his head kicks. You know, he'll throw a punch or, like, a lazy backhand, get you to slip, and then throw the head kick right at the perfect time as you're slipping, catch you, knock you out with it. And, uh, you know, he's done that back-to-back -back times, you know. And he gets that leg up there extremely fast, devastating power. He has a solid jab. He has a good job of a... Striking moving backwards at well, he'll kind of pot shot you. Seems to have big power with his punches. You know, his shots really snap the head back of his opponents. But he stands too flat-footed at times and right in front of you, I think, when he sets up. And uh, makes it susceptible to blitzes, you know, in combinations. I think that he actually will also be susceptible to leg kicks as well, even though he hasn't been in many fights. And uh, he has his chin too high in the air as well. And his 
grappling also needs improvements, but he has, you know, okay to solid takedown defense. Really wouldn't have to be worried about this one, that in this one. And uh, he doesn't throw a lot of volume. He got dropped uh, by a blitz against Brandon Ward. And uh, while Thiago Alves is on the downward side of his career, he did look amazing in his last fight against Patrick Cote. But, um, you know, Patrick Cote was retiring, so you have to wonder how much heart he had and uh, how much he put into that last camp. But, um, you know, Alves is a lot smaller than Curtis Millinder, and Millinder have a 10-inch reach advantage, which is a lot, man. But, um, you know, uh, Alves was supposed to fight Mike Perry, but uh, had to pull out of that one, but now he's coming back. He, gets, he has solid footwork, those heavy leg kicks, really nice left hook counters, uh, really quick with his punches, especially early. Nice right hand as well that he'll catch you when you're coming in with it. A really good uh, left kick to jab combination. And I believe uh, he's really going to be attacking that lead leg of Curtis Millinder. And I just think he's more explosive, the better athlete. Just much faster. I think he, ha he has more volume on the feet as well. Definitely has to be careful not to get caught. Millinder definitely can catch him. But I think Millinder's too flat-footed, stationary. And I think Alves is going to be able to catch him and knock him out here. I really do, man. I think he's going to be working on that front leg early on that first round. The second round, I think he's going to catch Millinder with the overhand left counter and drop him and then finish him with a ground and pound. And I'm going to go with Thiago Alves in this one. I think Thiago Alves definitely has a lot of fight left. Been in the UFC for a long time, but he's now uh, 34 years old and, um, you know, showed a much different game against Patrick Cote. He was showing, um, you know, more um, speed was much smaller, not as big and bulky. And I think that's going to be to his advantage as he gets older, man. Not to have that, um, you know, big muscle muscle and big frame. And uh, look a little bit better, a little bit quicker. Just use his technique. And up next, another amazing fight, man. James Vick against Francisco Trinaldo. And these are two guys that are, you know, perennially overlooked in this division, man, at 155. Uh, Fran Francisco Chinaldo's, uh, you know, 14-3 and three in the UFC. He was last night at 155. But um, I was looking at his record, and, you know, this is the first time that he's fighting out of Brazil in two years. And also he's fought in Brazil um, 14 times in the UFC, 11-3 and three in Brazil. And only two fights in the U.S. He's 1-1 one one in those fights. He also has a win in Canada. He knocked out Chad Laprise in Canada. But, um, you know, he's an absolute beast, man. Huge, strong, physically imposing. A lot of power as well. In that first round, he's extremely dangerous. Really good overhand left hand. But he has a great timing on, great counter with it as well. He uses in out movement to kind of disguise when he's going to come in and attack with shots. He's a veteran. You know, he can fight many different ways. Uh, good at striking, moving backwards, and good at counter striking, drawing you in. You know, such as in that Ross Pearson fight. And he's also good at, you know, moving forward, attacking against Chad Laprise. And uh, Trinado is very strong in the clinch as well. You know, beat up Paul Felder in the clinch. Uh, great takedown defense. And if you get him down, extremely aggressive off his back. Very hard to hold down. And uh, comes with a game plan, man. He's going to execute that game plan. And he has a very good high kick. And uh, throws very good liver shots as well. But he definitely tends to slow down in his fights. But he's shown a little bit of improvement in that as he's gone on. But uh, he'll be a tough test for anyone, you know, in this division. He's 39 years old. I have to wonder when the legs will fall off. But uh, haven't really shown any sign of that. Uh, Jim Miller was able to land some straight punches against him when Trinaldo was crashing the distance. And uh, Trinaldo rarely moves backwards. And, uh, you know, James Vick is tall, long. Likes to stay behind a snappy jab. Throws nice combinations, you know, three, four punch combinations in the pocket. He likes to, uh, you know, find his distance and start to catch you on the end of his punches. He'll throw nice leg kicks as well, kicks to the body, you know, kind of keeps to the body, front kicks. Very nice flying knee. He has a great chin as well, bite down the mouthpiece and throw in that pocket. He uses a lot of movement, you know, he's good around the outside of the cage, um, you know, not trying to get in a firefight with you. Um, solid takedown defense, but it's still a weaker point in his game, but definitely good at defending off his back, solid with chokes. He's a finisher man for sure. At three punches in a row in the UFC. Uh, great cardio. He used to leave his chin out there at times when he threw his jabs or his right hands and got clipped. You know, he got KO'd by Benir Dariush. But he doesn't really do that anymore. And I think he should be able to keep Francisco on the outside. He has a great step in knee as well and a great darse. 
You know, Trinado has struggled with grapplers in his career. You know, four of his five losses in the UFC are against uh, Kevin Lee, Peter Hallman, Glyson Tebow, and Michael Chiesa, who are all grapplers. But, you know, I kind of see um, uh, James Vick being able to stay on the outside and piece him up and actually rock Trinado and make it a very similar scenario to what happened against Kevin Lee, where Trinado panic shoots, and I think that James Vick's going to get a Darcy here. I really think it's a big deal that this fight's not in Brazil. You know, a 39-year-old coming all the way to the U.S., traveling, when he's very much used to fighting in Brazil, he's fought something like six times in a row there. I think that's going to be a big factor, you know, and I just think that James Vick has to be very careful not to get clipped with that overhand left. And if that doesn't happen, he's going to have this fight, man. I think that he has the better cardio than Chinaldo as well, and I think that Chinaldo's going to slow down. Vick's going to find his timing, find his groove, man, and really start to put it on... um, uh, Francisco Chinaldo and just uh, put a finish to him and I think he's going to finish him in that third round and uh, I'm sorry guys I actually missed a fight so I'm going to go back to it right now and I can't believe I missed this man because or uh, overlooked it because this is one of my favorite female fighters uh, of all time man I really love this girl Olivia Souza man she's just a fucking G dude love the way that she talks shit you know <laughs> gets in her opponent's uh, faces uh, says she has no fear she'll smell the fear in her opponent she's I just really love her, man. She's really awesome. And uh, fight's really aggressive, man. She backs up all the talk. Her jiu-jitsu is just extremely dangerous. She'll dive on submissions. In the clinch, she tries to get standing guillotines. Uh, she'll pull you down to her world, you know. Um, doesn't care about being on her back. Uh, pulls guard. Uh, likes to attack with leg locks off bottom. She'll attack with, uh, you know, double single leg shots as well. But her best takedowns are definitely her trips, judo, tri- judo throws. And, uh, you know, she'll fight for takedown sometimes, like, it's life or death, man. Like, she'll come in, run, and throw a sacrifice throws, you know, she doesn't give a fuck. And, uh, she can get caught in the guard. You know, Angela Hill was able to, uh, get on top and, um, stay in her guard. And, um, you know, uh, just, she wasn't able to, or she wasn't able to get out of Angela Hill's guard, I'm sorry. And, you know, and, but she was active body head, and um, she'll welcome, you know, people to come on top of her, and uh, she throws looping strikes on, on her feet, has a really, uh, you know, kind of looping hook style, but she does have a straight right hand, and uh, very little head up setups, you know, everything is full power, solid kick, she needs to get inside to be effective, you know, she'll bite down on the mouthpiece, and, uh, you know, throw down, uh, when you come in aggressively, she definitely, um, doesn't care, you know, she likes to fight that way, and, uh, she's fought many five-round fights in Invicta, you know, she'll posture a lot in her fights, you know, talks when she gets hit, uh, drops to her back, kind of tries to get you to, bait you to come down with her, but she has a great chin, you know, and she's definitely small for the weight class, you know, she might be, she might, should be a 105-er, but I think she'll struggle more with fighters who will move on the outside, use that kicking range, like she did against Angela Hill, because she's not really the best striker, and she doesn't have the greatest takedowns, but uh, someone that's willing to fight, you know, be on the inside against her, she has a great chance of beating all those all those women, you know, and uh, she has much better takedowns against the cage than she does on the open mat, and she'll try to, like, you know, get to the back against the cage, uh, jump on guillotines, and, uh, you know, she very much tries to go for the finish at the end of fights. You know, against Angela Hill, she almost got an armbar or a gu- and a guillotine at the end of that fight in the fifth round. She'll tag very hard with the finish, you know, and uh, she has good knockout power as well. You know, she knocked out um, Hamasaki at 105, who was, you know, a long time, been one of the best 105ers in the world. You uh, know, she knocked her out unconscious. And then, uh, then, she, then she came back won that strawweight title again against a very good prospect in uh, Marangin. I think uh, Marangin will be a very good fighter in the UFC. She's a better striker than Jessica Aguilar is. And, uh, you know, she's had a uh, liver kick finish against Deanna Bennett as well, who's in the UFC. She was an aging vet. You know, one time she was the number one uh, female in the world at 115, but she's been very inactive in the UFC. She tore her ACL in 20... In, uh, in 2015, and this will only be the third fight since then, and uh, she fights very aggressively as well, very fired up, very emotional, but she seems a bit stationary, very tense on the feet, she doesn't move her head, and she's willing to stand right in front of you, and just uh, throw down with you, and I think she likes to box, she doesn't really have many kicks, 
And I think that just plays right into the strength of uh, Liviana, Livia, Livina Souza, you know what I mean? And I think she might have the strike advantage against Souza, but Souza will be faster, more active, and um, more active. I think she'll get to the fight, to the ground, somehow, some way, you know. And uh, she's young and improving. You know, Aguilar's old, past her prime. Gets Courtney Casey. She couldn't even avoid uh, being up kicked. And I think that Sousa's just going to be able to uh, get a win. And I'm going to go by third round submission. Pretty confident in this one as well. So I'm going to go with uh, Lavinia Souza. And I'm really excited for her uh, to get fights in the UFC, man. She's one of the best uh, female fighters in the world right now, for pound for pound, man. Because she's not a 115er. And she goes on there and beats a lot of 115 pounders' asses, man. And she's. They had a 105 pound division for uh, the UFC. She would definitely be the best 105er in the world. But um, we're gonna move on now to the uh, co-main event, and this is an awesome fight. Man. Derek Lewis versus Marcin Tybora. And you know, Derek Lewis early on in his career definitely struggled with you know quicker, faster heavyweights that used kicks. You know, he struggled with Sean Jordan, struggled with uh, Matt Mitrione. But you know, I think that he's definitely gotten a lot better since then. You know, that Sean Jordan fight was all the way back in. Uh, June 2015, so almost two and a half years ago, and he's been extremely active, you know, one of the most active guys in the UFC, you know, he joined the UFC in um, 2014, and since 2014, he's fought, you know, quite a few times, I think he's fought um, at least more than 10 times, and uh, especially for a heavyweight that's extremely active, and uh, he's had a lot of wins, man, he KOs a lot of people, he definitely has extreme power, and uh, I think that his path to victory here is is going to be through grappling, man. I think that if he gets on top of Tybora, I know Tybora has a lot of good grappling credentials. He's a good grappler as well himself. But if he gets on top of Tybora, it'll be a good night for Tybora, man. I don't think Tybora's going to be able to handle that. I think it'll be done with. I think he'll be able to knock out Tybora if that happens, if he can get on top. And I think that he's what he's aiming to do, man, because I've seen a lot of his fight uh, footage that he's been putting out on Instagram, things like that. And he's been practicing a lot of ground and pound. And um, I think that if he gets Tybora down, if he has that game plan of getting in the clinch, wearing on Tybora, because we've seen Tybora struggle against big guys and struggle with getting worn on, you know, against Timothy Johnson. He lost that way. He lost that way, um, you know, early on in his career as well. And uh, he lost also as well to a 205er named Stephen Putz by TKO. So that really makes me wonder about his chin, you know. So I think if it gets tested, I think Derek Lewis could really put him out. But he did have a really decent fight in his last fight against Fabricio Verdum. But Verdum isn't, isn't nearly the same athlete as Derek Lewis is. I think Derek Lewis is much faster at closing that distance, much more explosive, and has more explosive power. And, uh, you know, Derek Lewis was injured in his last fight. I know that for a fact. I know a lot of people like to uh, question that, but... You know, I know for a fact that he was injured, and he's been dealing with that back problem for a while. And, um, you know, I from all the accounts, from all accounts, it's much better now. And um, I think that he's going to put it on Tybor, man. I know Tybor is kind of, you know, the trendy pick here. I think a lot of people are falling in love with uh, his knockouts by head kick. But, you know, we've seen what he did against Andre Arlovsky. You know, very boring decision, very tentative, very scared to get hit. And against Verdum as well, you know, another very tentative performance. And I think that against Derek Lewis, those are the guys that he eats up, man. Against Derek Lewis, you need to either really engage in taking him down, wearing him out like Roy Nelson did, even though Roy Nelson um, didn't get the victory there. Or, you know, just have a much, a much, uh, you know, stronger striking advantage like Mark Hunt, which Tybor, I just don't believe, has that. He's not even close to the credential striker of Mark Hunt a very very more explosive athlete than Derek Lewis is which I don't think that Tybor is you know Sean Jordan's a guy that did backflips at, at 265 that um played fullback at LSU you know Matt Mitrione is also a former football player who's extremely fast extremely athletic while Tybor is athletic as well I don't think he's quite athletic as Derek Lewis or quite as fast and I just think Derek Lewis at some point man is going to get him on the ground and finish him so I'm going to go with Derek Lewis to a, get a win in his uh, home state by second round, ground and pound TKO. And I think that he's going to call out uh, Francis, and I would really want to see that fight, man. I would really be interested in that fight. And 
Either way, even if Tybora wins, it's good news for that division. You know, there's a lot of new blood coming in with last week as well with the uh, wins of Curtis Blades and Tai Tuivasa. Now, these are two newer heavyweights as well getting down. And, um, you know, so we're starting to see a uh, revolution in that division, starting to see some new names, and that's always good to see. And uh, up next, we have Donald Cerrone against Yancey Medeiros. And I've been going back and forth and back and forth on this fight, man, because... You know, a lot of people are talking about the damage that Donald Cerrone's taken recently. You know, he's lost three in a row. TKO, two of those three fights. Um, got TKO'd against uh, Darren Till just in October, four months ago. And um, But, you know, those fights that uh, Yancey Medeiros fought against Alex Oliveira was in December, man. And that was a war. He got dropped multiple times back and forth. And those aren't free either. Even though he got the win, even though he got the TKO, still taking damage, you know, against... Eric Silva, the same thing, took a lot of damage, you know, actually, um, Gianti actually absorbs more significant strikes than he lands, uh, you know, which is just not a very good, um, strategy, but, you know, he has an amazing chin and been able to get away with it, but I think that Donald Cerrone is actually going to come in here with a very boring game plan, I know that Cerrone is someone that comes to fight, never has game plans, never gives a fuck, you know, that's his whole... I think he's going to be playing it up all week that that's his M.O., but I think that he knows that he needs a win here. I think that he knows that his back's against the proverbial wall. You know, if he loses this fight, that's it. I think that maybe people will start to get in his ear, say that, that he needs to retire, things like that. He has a high salary. Uh, will the UFC want to keep him around? Think So I think that he really knows that, and I think that he's going to come into the game plan to grapple here, man. I think that he's going to try to get Yancey against the cage hold him there, try to take him down, and, uh, you know, just try to win through grappling, I don't think he's going to want to be in a war with Yancey, I think he's going to be on the outside using his kicks, and, you know, Yancey Medeiros, for being, you know, a warrior, he's an amazing fighter, great striker, but he isn't, you know, the type of striker for, you know, he gets in so many wars, but he isn't the type of striker that's, you know, moving forward and and, uh, you know, finding him a very pressure style that Cerrone, you know, struggles against. He's a guy that, you know, against Alex Oliveira was moving backwards. He likes to move backwards, try to, uh, you know, um, take advantage of your uh, forward pressure, snipe you from the outside and, uh, you know, counter you. And that's kind of those type of people that Cerrone likes to fight. He likes to get those people that are willing to move backwards against him, the guys that get in his face, the Nate Diaz's, the Darren Till's, the George Monsterall's, the Robbie Lawler's, you know, RBA, the guys that get in his face, that maul him. Those are the guys that really, um, you know, eat him up. But uh, Yancey isn't a guy that does that. Yancey's a guy that likes to uh, counter punch. He likes to move backwards. He likes to um, time you as you're coming in, catch you with hard shots. And I think that that plays right into Cerrone's game. And Cerrone did break his nose very bad in that last fight. And that's something that you have to be aware of because you've seen – what that does to guys like Rory McDonald, where it just wasn't right in his next fight against Stephen Thompson. He got broke again, didn't want to get hit in it. And I have to see how that nose recovers. But um, I'm actually going to go with Donald Cerrone here, and I'm going to go with him by uh, fourth round submission. I think that he's going to be able to uh, just continuously take down Yancey, and I think that maybe at one point Yancey, who's weak to the body, will get hit with, uh, caught with the you know, liver kick go down, Cerrone will follow him, and uh, just submit him there, man, I think it might be a rear naked choke, and uh, I'm going to go with Donald Cerrone, and uh, you know, I think Donald Cerrone will get things back on track, Yancey Medeiros is a warrior, definitely beat a lot of great guys, but it seems like every time he gets um, at a high level, he gets beat up, man, like he got knocked out against Hustam Kabloff, uh, submitted against Jim Miller, uh, knocked out against uh, Poirier, Really uh, beat up really bad. Almost finished multiple times by Francisco Chinaldo. So he really struggles against that upper echelon. Never has uh, pushed through that ceiling. And um, I think Cerrone is going to be able to uh, push him back, man. But if not, that's a really damning loss for Cerrone. Because this is someone that, you know, in his career, in the past, he would really eat up, man. And uh, So uh, I'm going to give you guys my... Uh, most confident pick of the week, and that's going to be uh, Oscar Pachota to defeat Tim Williams. And um, for the parlay of the week, guys, I'm going to give you guys a um, two-fight parlay this time, and I'm going to go ahead and go 
with Jared Gordon and Oscar Pichota. I think that those guys will um, get the job done for you. And if you want to do a three-fight parlay, I think that another good guy to throw in there would be James Vick. But I'm going to give you guys uh, Oscar Pichota and... Um, Yep, that's it. So I'm gonna. That's the uh, parlays that I'm gonna give you guys. And uh, I also think Alex Morono is a pretty good um, bet, but I'm not sure if he'll be coming in as a big pay, big favorite. So I um, hope you guys like the show. Um, see you again uh, next week and uh, subscribe for more. Thanks, guys.